Yeah. So what do you mean by logical meaning? So illogical meaning means that oh, Loki has just uh, joined. Welcome, welcome Loki. We were just we have just started with the basic grammar structure here. We are going to discuss about the various types of questions that we get in reading, uh, writing, and language tests. And we have just started. You haven't missed anything as of now. So I'll mute you right now. Uh, I'll put you on mute so that you know there won't be any disturbance. Next five ten minutes, I'll explain all the rules of grammar. So illogical mean meaning means such kind of questions where you are supposed to like these kind of questions, kept or eliminated sort of questions. What exactly is the situation? How do you approach these situations? Whether the sentence should be kept or eliminated. You basically basically look at the meaning of the paragraph. Does it really make sense here? They give you a paragraph, and with respect to that paragraph, there is another sentence. And they ask whether this particular sentence should be inserted here or not. Does it really make sense? So you have to look at the context of the question, what is going on, what the context of the paragraph, and accordingly decide whether this particular uh, statement really should be inserted in this section or not. You are basically you are trying to see whether it is making sense in the larger picture or in the context of the paragraph, right? So that is what is illogical meaning. See, when you see a writing or language question you can ask yourself i m t a c t s first of all in which category does this question falls is it something related to illogical meaning or it is related to modifiers now what do you mean by or uh, i mean so you know once you categorize it then you can approach and uh, kind of know which rules should apply there if it is not a part of IMTA CTS, which is logical meaning modifier, pronoun, agreement, connectors, tenses, and sentence structure, then it could be any one of these. It could be related to word choice, or uh, in fact, rest of the things are covered. All the four are already covered here. Right? Of course, punctuation is something which is not covered. So something sometimes the question could be related to punctuations or word choice. Otherwise, rest of the things would be checked by this formula of IMPA CTS itself. So the moment you look at a question of grammar, you can decide whether it is one of these and then go about solving it. Now, what is this modifier? Can somebody tell me the meaning of modifier? Let me ask Loki. Okay, what is a modifier? If you can help me with that, it's like a change. Yeah, so modifier is not actually transition. If you are thinking of modifier as a transition, can somebody give me some other example or some other explanation of what is a modifier? So let me just tell you this modifier could be either uh, an adjective or an adverb any statement a word or a group of words which qualifies an uh, a noun or a verb would be a modifier right for example mohit comma a boy from us took sat okay so what is this? This part between two commas. This is modifier. Yeah, this is qualifying Mohit. All right. So a modifier. And now look at this. The placement of modifier is very important. 
just after mohit i have written a by boy from us so this makes sense the modifier should be placed next to the word it tries to modify now let us just try to differentiate this situation with this statement and let's try to identify if there is something incorrect there so if i say uh, let me write it in this color jumping out of the sea What is this state? No, yeah, let me first write this down first. Jumping out of the sea, I saw a fish. Okay, so let us try to analyze this sentence. It says, jumping out of the sea, I saw a fish. What is this part? Is this a modifier? Jumping out of the sea. So, it's a participant phrase which is talking about some action done by somebody who is the person who is doing the action i which means i was jumping out of the sea and i saw a fish okay what the writer really wanted to see, wanted to see was that this guy was let's say going by the sea and there was a ship jumping out and you know in the sea might be that there are ships jumping out and then getting inside again something like that but what is the meaning of this sentence if you look at this jumping out of the sea i saw a fish what does it mean is the sentence fine or not fine if i want to tell that the ship was jumping out of the sea and i saw it does this sentence really convey that meaning? No. So what does no. it what does it convey? Uh, you dropping out of the sea. Come again, please. Uh, you jumping out of the sea. Exactly. I'm jumping out of the sea, which is factually incorrect. It's not me. It's the it's the it's the fish which is jumping out. So how can I correct this? If I have to correct this, what should I do? I'll put the participant phrase in the end. Yeah, that makes sense. I read this first and then I put it here. I saw a fish jumping out of the sea. Fantastic. That's correct. So the placement of modifiers is important. If, the, if this modifier is before I, which means it is qualifying I. If it is before fish, that means it is qualifying fish and we'll see these kind of questions there whenever there is a double dash or a double comma we have to understand that this is a modifier it's trying to modify the word just before that and the placement of that word is important then there are pronoun related questions and there are two types of pronouns you know there are singular pronouns and there are plural pronouns and sometimes there are they, they mix that up Whenever there is a, what is a pronoun, first of all? It's a like pronoun. he, she. Yeah, he. it's like he, she, it. It replaces a noun. Yes, exactly. It replaces a noun. Now, as you know, the nouns are also singular or plural. The pronouns also has to be singular or plural. They would be either singular or plural, right? Yeah. Depend, depending on the type of noun they are trying to replace. Now, if we uh, have a sentence like this, Mohit and Loki attended the class, He answered all the questions. What is the problem here? You don't know who answered it. Yeah. So what are the ways to correct this? Uh, 
Uh, you can change he to they. I can change he to they, which is correct. What else can I do? You can change he to Mohit or Loki. Exactly. So this is what it is. We have to take care of the case of pronoun, whether it is singular or plural. The uh, yeah. So we know that that. Otherwise, this becomes dangling. He is a dangling modifier because it is not very clearly identifying which noun is it replacing. So whenever there is a pronoun, there has to be a clearly identified. Antecedent. These are the two antecedents. Antecedents means nouns which come first. So there are pronoun related questions. When there is a long sentence, identifying the pronoun becomes a little difficult when the nouns are based at a far off distance. Does it make sense? Okay. Yeah. So, you know, so this is what, see, what I'm trying to give you here today is a little bit of mindset or a little bit of formula or a format or a framework you can call it you know so when you read a question of grammar you try to identify what kind of problem is it having is it logical meaning is it the placement of modifier is it pronoun you know so you can classify the question saying that in which category it is and once you know the category of the question it would be easy to solve it does it make sense so yeah. you, would have, you would have kind of a paradigm or a structure to approach it. Then there can be agreement question. What do you mean by agreement? Agreement is subject verb agreement. Something similar to what we said here with respect to pronouns also. Now in, now in case of nouns also, there has to be an agreement between subject and verb, right? So in case we have a singular noun, we have, like for example, Mohit goes to school, but Mohit and Loki go to school, those kind of structures, right? That is subject verb agreement. In case the subject is plural, the, we have to conjugate the verb accordingly. We know this. This is quite intuitive. Just that we have to be conscious of it. The, looking at the question, we should be able to identify that. Then there are questions related to connectors. Now, what exactly is the use of a connector and when do we use it? So, what is a connector? And is it like a conjunction? Yes, yes, yes. It's conjunction or connector. Both of them are like the same. Thing. They relate to uh, the same thing. Like so basically, when we talk about connectors, there are different types of connectors. The connectors are actually like they connect the two parts of the paragraph or two different sentences. And when we talk about them, we can either uh, we can call them as extensions or expansions. When we say and or further or furthermore or moreover, which means we are not contradicting something, we are going in the same direction, isn't it? It can be a contradiction like, however. I write here so, however, or but, or nevertheless, right? Yesterday I was doing a question. The contradiction was introduced with the help of still. Can still be a contradiction? How can we introduce a contradiction with still? Let me give you an example. We are taking so, so many steps to control Corona. People have introduced, some of the cities have introduced lockdown and there is master testing happening. Still the number of cases is increasing. So can you see something like a counterintuitive? Still is introducing a contradiction, is it? 
you know, when you are taking so many steps to control corona, it should it should stop, it should lessen in its intensity. But here, what we are saying, the cases are on the rise. So, what does it convey? Does it convey a contradiction? Yeah. yeah. So that's what it is. So we can use still also to convey a contradiction. So the uh, the this connector can be in the same direction. It can tell us that this is the, like extending the same idea, or it could be contradicting. Or can there be other types of uh, connectors? What is this consequently, therefore, does as a result? In which category can would they go? Where do you use these kind of connectors? So these are cause and effect, isn't it? So the connectors could be exp extenders or exp uh, the ones that are used for expansion, or they they can show a contradiction, or they can show cause and effect, right? So depending on the context, you would know what kind of connector is could come there. Then there are questions related to tenses. Now, what do you mean by tenses? Of course, you know present, past, or future. And whenever there is a question on tense, you are supposed to maintain the consistency of tense. You are supposed to use the same tense throughout the paragraph. So in this paragraph, if we started with present tense, the whole of it should be in present tense. It should not be jumping between present and past. Right? The last thing that you have yeah. to check is sentence structure. What do you mean by sentence structure? The sentence that you write should be very precise. Tell me what is the problem with this sentence. I go for annual leaves every year. What is the problem with this sentence? Annual means the same thing as every year. Yeah, so this is redundant. I don't have to say every year I go for annual leaves or I get leaves annually. Right? I get annual leaves every year. Seems like one of them is redundant. You know? So you have to go with the sentence which is the most precise one and which conveys the, men the meaning in the least possible number of words. Does it make sense? Okay, so it has got a little messy, I'll clean it. Although, I mean, you don't have to write it. I'm going to send this whole thing to you once uh, we are done with it. So that should be okay. And uh, uh, for, for all the lessons that we are going to do, I've also created the videos. So the answers would be available to you in the form of videos beforehand itself. That will help a great deal. You can always go through the answers. I mean, see, what I see is that there are different types of learners. Some of them are visual. Some of them are kinesthetic. And some of them are auditory. Have you heard of this? So visual learners are the learners which who learn by seeing something. So if you see something happening, you understand, okay, this is how it is. So if I do an exercise in front of you, you understand, okay, this is how it is supposed to be done. Kinesthetic are the ones who learn by movement. So they have to do the exercise along with me. So they also do it. They, when they are involved in the motion and the activity, they learn it. And auditory are the ones who are able to learn it only through their ears directly. So if I tell them something, they would understand it, isn't it? Some people say that all the learners are of different types. Some are visual, some are kinesthetic, some are auditory. My experience is that we are all the mix of three. It's not that we sometimes, I mean, we are only visual, that we have to see something, then only we will learn. Sometimes we learn by listening things, isn't it? 
there are a few things which we would learn only by doing for example the test however uh, the knowledge of whatever knowledge uh, of all the rules you have you have to do the test so it's only by doing the test that we would understand isn't it and a little visual memory is also important like for example if you remember i m p a c t s and if it it's kind of imprinted in your mind would it not be easy for you to remember and apply this rule so we are a combination of all the three so in case you have got something to hear to or listen to something to do and something to see it would be easy for you to remember is that right yeah yeah so i'll be giving the recording as well so that you can revise it you can see it you can hear it and of course you are going to do one full test as well the assignment for you today is going to be one full test which is test 9 of sat all right so you'll be doing the test which comprises of the reading section as well as the writing section and i'll be sending you the complete list of tutorial i mean the recorded answers also of this how to approach a certain question what is the right answer how to get the right answer i would be sending those recordings as well so we would be expected to go through those test papers evaluate yourselves with the help of the recordings as well as the answers there and in the next session what we are going to do we will do a q and a based on your learning will that be interesting so what i'm trying to say yeah. is what i'm trying to say is yeah so you know what i have found is the best way to learn, learn something is learning by discovery if i take away the fun of discovery from you that i tell you everything related to something and you don't get to discover discover you don't get a chance to fail i'm taking away a lot of fun isn't it is is doing some questions incorrectly or you know i mean let's put it let me put it in a very simple way there is a lot of uh, thrill in discovering something new is it there when you yeah. get to know oh this is what i taught myself I, i think the retention is also the highest the fun is also the highest and uh, the learning is also uh, the highest what i mean to say is if you do a test let's say you went wrong on question number 6 but there is an explanation available to question number 6 you read that explanation you understand oh this is what i was supposed to do here and you understand that okay i am done with question number 6 now 5 minutes back i was not aware of how to do this now i have self taught myself to do this would it not be fantastic that okay i know this from the stage of not knowing something you have come to the stage of knowing it and you made a record of it as well this is what i want to follow so i would be giving you the test i'll be giving you the answers i'll be giving you the explanations the expectation is that you would have done the test you would have checked the answers you would have gone through the exp exp explanations very quickly now there can be two things the explanations make sense to you the explanations do not make sense to you right if it makes sense it's fine you are done with that if it does not make sense in the next session we are going to discuss it will it be good yeah can we go with this kind of structure okay yeah so this is what we are going to call okay So let me come back to grammar now. Um, okay, one more thing before we move on. I just want to quickly show this to you. Um, just give me one second. Stop sharing this, and I show that as well. And I know you have you all seen corrections log. Have you started making it? Did I show you corrections log in the earlier class? Are you aware of something called as corrections log? Yes. Yeah. You showed it to us. 
okay and you have started making the corrections log also i've made a correction log for all of you and shared it with you no oh okay. no okay 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 then i'll i'll uh, but you know what it is so basically whatever errors you do you would record it into an excel file and i'm going to share that corrections log with all of you and uh, so i will load up this one so rishi laya loki and mohit i'm going to share a corrections log with you wherein you would be recording all the mistakes so there would be four columns which would be test number the question number or the question type like test number 9 question type is grammar uh, question number is 3 and this is the explanation so it would be an excel which would be explaining all the errors i'll send that to you and you can make it uh, so you can just record it i'll send some sample answers in that like it will tell what is supposed to be written and so for all the questions where you went wrong you will be maintaining a corrections log which would be an explanation of what went wrong all right you have have i shown you some correction someone's corrections log have you seen it in any of the sessions you have seen how to maintain it let's show it to uh, you i think so you have seen it right or no yeah i, mean, I think you uh, showed it to us know. like on the first day yeah you have already got it yeah and so that's what i want you would be maintaining it that so we have questions where we go wrong you would be writing a note on that okay so what we have seen up till now is uh, this we have studied the part of grammar which talks about imp acts apart from this imp acts there are certain rules related to punctuations also that they check is that right yeah yeah so let us tell me what types of punctuations you have heard of let me just write a few categories of them top punctuations are there go punctuations are there and other punctuations are there so we can classify all the punctuations into these three categories all right uh so stop punctuations would be punctuations such as a full stop a comma or a semicolon right they they tell us that we have to stop go punctuations are like colon or a double dash or a single dash also and other punctuations are like quotes whatever is left would be in the other punctuations and you see them very less often and that the rules are not very very like it's not all driven by rules you usually are tested on these so what is the difference between a full stop a comma and a semicolon can you tell me full stop and comma are pretty straight forward but we'll still talk about them first of all let us talk about full stop when to use a full stop yeah, pointer ending a sentence end the sentence okay can i say mohit is an athlete laya do you draw what do you yeah. you are a draw, you are a painter i can say can i say that mm -hmm. so can i say like this laya is a painter is this sentence fine can i put a full stop between yeah yes. yeah all right can i also put a semicolon in place of full stop here mohit is an athlete semicolon laya is a painter is that okay yes. not okay what do you say yeah so what is the difference between a full stop and a semicolon no difference as far as grammar is concerned there is no difference wherever we put a full stop we can also put a semicolon which means a full stop where do we where do we use a full stop where do we put a full stop can i say 
Mohit yeah. did not attend the class full stop because he was not feeling well. No, you can't say it like that. Why? Why? Uh, because the second part of the sentence is, is incomplete. Exactly. exactly. It's because it's a dependent cause. That is correct. This means I can use a full stop to separate two full sentences. This should be a complete sentence, which means it should be able to stand by itself. The other part also should be a complete sentence. It should be able to stand by itself. So if, if I cut this part, I cut this part. This is all fine. This is all fine. Isn't it? Similarly, if I yeah. cut this, this is also complete in itself. It can stand by itself. So in between these two, I can have either a full stop or a semicolon. So this is the test you are going to apply. Can these two sentences stand by themselves? You can either put a full stop or a semicolon. Semicolon is a little lighter version of a full stop, right? So when you are talking about two people doing something, you know, the context is not changing a great deal. So rather than putting a full stop, which is like a very strong punctuation, I would prefer putting a semicolon. Does it make sense? Yeah, but then yeah. this is more or less dependent on a person's perception. It's, it's not that there would be any grammatical error. I mean, it's not that it would be incorrect to put a full stop if somebody prefers a semicolon. So it's not a grammatical error. It's more a convention or a personal preference to use a semicolon or a full stop, which means you would never be tested on this kind of question, whether you should put a semicolon or a full stop in this situation, because they are replaceable. Both of them would be right. Does it make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And this comma is used for, it's either a list separator or to put a modifier, isn't it? Mohit, comma Laya, comma Rishi. Okay, let me put it like this itself. Attended the class. What is the problem with this? Oh, there's you need no like an end. Yeah, you need an end here. This is the convention that before the last that before the last word in the list, we put we preceded with an end. So we, we uh, kind of separate these words with comma in this way. Do we understand these three now? Do we? Yes. Let's see. You know, I, I know there would be a number of other situations as well where these punctuations come into play. But then more or less, this is the thing. This semicolon is also used as a super comma. This is like, I saw Delhi comma India, semicolon, New York, comma USA, semicolon, Frankfurt, comma Germany. So I'm using a combination of comma and uh, semicolon. I saw Delhi, comma India, semicolon. New York, comma USA, New York, comma Holland, USA, Holland, Frankfurt, comma Germany, and Frankfurt, Frankfurt, comma. Can you see me seeing a combination of comma and semicolon here? Is this is this making sense to you? Yeah. So yes. So when we have a list, you know, I'm writing Delhi, comma India, and then putting it uh, putting a semicolon. So this is a separator for this group, I'm not putting a comma here because I, this is one unit and I want to show this as a single unit. So I put Delhi comma India, semicolon, New York comma USA. So New York is in USA and I'm writing a semicolon and Frankfurt comma Germany. So I'm not putting a semicolon here, this is a full stop, yeah? So this is where we use a semicolon as a super comma when there is a comma separated list and we still want to make groups within that itself. Within that list, we want to show some kind of separation. We use a semicolon to separate that list. Does it make sense? 
Yes. Yeah. Laya, is this fine? Yes. Okay. Now the the second set of uh, punctuations are co punctuations like colon or a double dash or a single dash. Where do you use a colon? When you're giving a list. When you are giving a list or you are giving an explanation. I was extremely tired. And I want to give a little explanation to this tired. Can I put a semicolon and I write something like I worked for 15 hours without a break? No. Can I put a semicolon and say that? So I was extremely tired. Not semicolon, sorry, a colon, a colon. And I say I worked for 15 hours without a break. Will it, will it be fine? I was extremely tired, colon. I worked for 15 hours without a break, full stop. Yeah. Will that be okay? Who said yeah? Oh, uh, Loki. Okay, Loki. Thank you so much. So, anyone else, do you agree with this or this is not fine? I was extremely tired, colon. I worked for 15 hours without a break. Like, can't you put semicolon instead of Oh. I was extremely tired. In fact, for this situation, semicolon also makes sense. I was extremely tired because this is a full sentence and I put a semicolon. I worked for 15 hours without a break. So a semicolon also qualifies it, but that does not mean that I cannot put a colon. A colon is used to separate or uh, to, to further to give further explanation for the word that immediately precedes it. So if I want to qualify tired and I want to give a little explanation for this tired, I can use a colon and tell what was the reason. I can I can just to just to make it sound like a little more connected. It was the 15th hour of the day without taking a single break. You know, then I think this semicolon would not really make sense. I mean, it still it will make sense. I can put a semicolon then too. But yes, I can always use a colon as well. So let's just try. I mean, if I have to tell you what is the use of a colon, a colon is just used to give extra details of the word which immediately precedes it. And when you use a colon, this part should be a complete sentence. The part which precedes the colon has to be complete sentence. So I was extremely tired. Can it stand by itself? Yeah. Yes. yes. Then I can put a colon and give an explanation for that. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. a colon is used to give uh, an explanation for something. When do we use a double dash? What is the use of this double dash? A double dash, it is also called as M dash, or we can also use two commas. Is it like when you add a sentence that doesn't relate to the stuff you're talking about in the paragraph, like you start with one and like you put that thing and end it. Yeah, yeah. Something which is like an extra detail, which really do not contribute a great deal to the meaning of the sentence. Like, for example, if I say Mohit, Laya and Rishi. Let's say uh, studying in US, the students from US. Uh, took SAT in 2020. Now, if even if I cut this, it does not really affect my sentence. Of course, I get some less details, but then as far as the sentence is concerned, this is an extra detail. So 
I can put this in double dash. Something like a little explanation or an expansion of or some detail about the nouns which we are using in the sentence. It really do not is not very mandatory or indispensable to the overall meaning of the sentence. We put that in double dash. So double dash is to give some extra details. It can also be separated by two commas. In that case, we call it as a modifier. You know, the extra details of it. So you can either use double dash or use two commas. Both of them are one and the same. Where do you use a single dash? Mohit was the star performer. And I put a dash, a big dash. He got all questions correct. Is this sentence fine? I'm putting a long dash here. And not not that long that should be so dark. Just try it. A little longer dash, then small two dash. What is the meaning of this? And what am I trying to do? It's like an afterthought, I guess, or like another extra detail. Yeah, an afterthought. Or, you know, there is a shift of emphasis. Whatever comes after dash gains all the flashlight, gets all the attention. So I wanted to shift your attention from this sentence to this sentence. Mohit was the star performer. Dash, he got all questions correct. So yeah, an afterthought or a shift of focus can be uh, executed by a single dash. So that's where we use single dash at times. Uh, but then, yeah, of course, it is very, very rare. But yes, I have seen this single dash used and tested in some sad tests. It's not out of yeah, the other level. They do test on that. And then after that, there are some other punctuations like colon, uh, a, a possessive, or uh, is this is this statement fine? It's a great day today. Can you find some error in this sentence? Yeah, you can put an explanation mark at the end. All right. Anything else? There should be an apostrophe um, yeah. for it. Yeah. Should it be like this? Yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Because it's supposed to be it is. Exactly. It is supposed to be it is. And when you say apostrophe S, yes, it's, it's a contraction. Right? So you use this apostrophe sign for a contraction and also for a possessive. It is. Laya's birthday today. Is it your birthday today? No. Okay, but then if I have to say that, I'll say it like this. So this is possessive. Is that right? So we can either use a possessive like this, or we can make use of contraction. And you have to differentiate between the two. This is very common, isn't it? And they test you on this whether it is a contraction. So it is whenever you are, they are, sometimes they are is written like this. They are enjoying the party. So this is, this is not a possessive, this is a contraction. You are, you are shortening it by putting a, this uh, sign. But then yeah, rest of the, Punctuations, I haven't seen them being tested in SAT, so we'll not go into 
all of them in great detail. And uh, this is pretty much about uh, the type of punctuation they test. Apart from that, what what else? What other skills do you need to ace in the grammar? Wait, I have a question. Wait, I have a question. Yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, please go ahead. Oh, when they put students, why do they put the thing uh, at the front? Stuff in the front, like let's say it's, and they put it in front of the S. Like, I don't get that. Students. Yeah. And the, yeah, they put it in front of the S, like like this. No, in front of the S. In front of the S, like this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good thing. Can you please explain what is the use of this? Students' room. Let us say. Yeah, this is interesting. Who asked this question? Rishi. Yeah, Rishi. I'm. So thank you. You asked this question. This is something interesting. So there are two types of possessives. There are singular possessives and plural possessives. So when I say this is a boy's room, I'm talking about one boy who lives in this room. So I've got a boy and a girl. So they are my. This is my son. This is my daughter. And if I have to say this is my boy's room, which means this is the place where my son lives. What if I say this is boy's room? What does it mean? In this room, many boys live. Probably I'm talking about uh, what do you call place where all these students live together on shared places? Something like a hostel or you know where many boys share the room and live together. What is that called? It's some word for it. Dormitory? So do you understand the difference between the two? Yeah. yeah. A possessive can be a singular possessive or a plural possessive. So if I say girl's room, this is the room where just one girl lives. This is the girl's room, my girl's room. She's my, it's my daughter's room, something like that. But if I say girl's room, it would be a like many girls living. All right? All right? Yeah, Rishi, that was important. Yeah, Rishi, that was important. Okay. So we are done with and I'll be I'll be sharing the uh, recording of this as well, so you could have it there in the uh, for for revision and for understanding it. Uh, I'll quickly show you this. Uh, I think let me not share that those videos with you right now. Should I? Would you like to see the explanations of the questions or you would like to do the questions and then still I'll, I'll give that to you so once so while i'm opening it i can also tell you about the homework what you're going to do this week is you're going to go through complete test nine so you'll be doing all the sections of test nine, which comprises of the reading as well as the grammar sections of it. Okay. So this is what you're going to do. And I'll be sending the answers. I mean, the answers to these tests would also be there. Uh, from uh, the micro merits website, you're going to get uh, some 15 questions every day. So if you go to those questions, I mean, every day you would be doing 15 questions. If you do 15 questions every day, by the end of uh, the week, you would have done almost 90 questions, isn't it? 15, 6, or 90. So this will make sure that you are in touch with all these sections every day. Don't do the whole test in one go. I mean, it is advisable. It is always advisable to do the whole test in one go. But then, in case you want to break it right now, it's absolutely fine. 
the purpose is not to build stamina at this point in time the purpose is to do these tests so yeah you will be doing those 15 questions every day and what you're going to do is test nine one second i'll open the chat Wait, so test number nine, you do 15 questions, right? Yeah, test nine, you're going to do the whole test. Do the whole test. Oh, so you will do so what the, the questions? two questions of 15 questions every day. Okay. See, I'll, I'll show you the mathematics in a while. This is what I have planned for you actually. In your essay, oh, in your essay, in your SAT, are you able to see my screen right now? Yeah. Yes. Yes. So in the SAT, so in the you're SAT, going to get you're going to get questions of reading. Questions of reading. And 44 questions of grammar, which makes it 96 questions overall in the English section. Okay. What I'm planning is that every week you should be able to do one complete test, one full test in one week. So if I want you to do one complete test in one week, you have to do 96 questions. But then I won't like you to sit for three hours, four hours together and do all these 96 tests. 96 questions. What I planned is I want you to do 15 questions every day. So, in a week's time, you would be able to do almost 105 questions. So, every week, like every day, if you do 15 questions, by the end of six days, I mean, roughly you would be finishing the whole test. Does it make sense? You know, so in a month's time, you would have done four tests as a practice. Will it be good? And it will not be a big burden. How much time will it take to do 15 questions? Maybe 20 to 25 minutes, not more than that. As of now, I know I'll be going a little slow on each of these paragraphs because my purpose is not to test you right now. My purpose is to give an exposure to learn. It does not make sense to test you at this point in time, does it? When I give you a full test and I ask you to do the test, I don't think it's a good thing. I think first we should do at least three tests in a staggered manner where we do small portions of the test and you understand them very properly. Once you are through with that, then it makes sense to test you. So that is the purpose. For next three weeks, I want you to do in three weeks at least three tests very, very thoroughly. If you do three tests very, very thoroughly in three weeks, you would learn all the rules of the game and you would have applied them three times in three full tests. When you have applied them, when you have understood them, when you have made a corrections log for the questions you, you go wrong, when you get exposed to all the different types of questions in reading and grammar, would you not be super smart? This is a super smart stat participant. This is my plan. Do you have any suggestions for it? Anything from your side which you want me to change or if you want to incorporate or I have your buy-in in this that the artist makes sense. Not really, no. Does it make sense? Will it be useful? Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm pretty sure. I'm very, very excited to give this exercise to you. It's not going to be very heavy. 15 questions would be like 30 minutes, whatever time. I'm not really bothered about time right now. And I want you also to go slow on this as of now because we are learning. And it's okay to consider some questions a little more deeply. It's okay to read the passage maybe twice or thrice. 
but that does not mean that you would deliberately that go slow. Note down your time note output. Your time. You will you will note the start time and the end time for every exercise. I started at 7 p.m. I finished it at 7:20. So you would have a little track of how much time it took. But again, I am not trying to deliberately go faster on this one. So this is what I want. I want a track of time, but I don't want to rush. And this is what you are going to do. You are going to do uh, test. This the test would be coming from merit, uh, that micro merit site itself. You know, so you would be doing the test online, and you will be submitting the answers there. But yes, this is the test from test nine. The explanations and everything is available on internet by itself. Okay, so this is what I want you to do, and uh, this is your assignment for uh, the coming week. I've also shared you that YouTube link, so the explanations and everything would be I'll be, I'll be uploading on there, on the li link, so you would be able to see them there also. I've already uploaded a few things there of test nine, um, and I think this would be really very very helpful to you once you know the types of questions and the test. Do go through this these uh, questions. I uh, if you go to the link, I'll. Uh, I mean, the last four or five uh, presentations which I have uploaded yesterday are all related to reading. Can we have another five minutes? Is it fine if we discuss for five minutes or you guys are in a hurry? It's okay, you have another five minutes? I'll quickly wrap yeah. up in just five minutes, okay? See, what I have tried to do is. In any case, I'll upload it. So in case somebody has some work to do, can log out and go and do it. But it will not take more than five minutes. Okay. When you do reading passages of, of SAT, there is a certain structure they follow. The first passage is always a narrative passage, wherein there is a story, like a personal story. The second passage is always either for science, from science, or from some sociology kind of thing. And this third one is also from science or sociology. What I mean by sociology no, is not sociology specifically, it could be anything from humanities. The fourth one, so second and third, the fourth one is usually a combined passage. This could be again anything from science or from humanities. Mostly it is from humanities where there is some freedom movement and those kind of things discussed. And the last passage is again something from science. <clears throat> I have explained this in a presentation very, very deeply as to how to approach a narrative passage, how to approach a science-based passage, what are the different structures that we can follow. So I'll, that, that's there in the presentation where, you know, you would learn what is the right approach, the right approach? to do a narrative passage and how does it differ from a science-based passage, right? So. I expect you to see that presentation. In any case, in the next class, we are going to discuss that. And I think, uh, as I said, I want you to discover things and do. I will be supporting you with all the information that is required for you to do the test. And of course, if you're not able to understand something, we will be doing in the class. In any case, we will touch upon every detail in the classes that we do. But more or less, uh, my expectation is that the next class in the form of lots of questions and answers where you tell me that okay this is the test i was doing this question took me a lot of time but this particular passage i was really fast i don't understand this passage it was really difficult for me to read and find out what is the meaning of this question that would be interesting all right anything that you have to share any questions you have for me for the session? I don't have any questions. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. For, you do, uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, so have a wonderful.
wonderful week. Have and a wonderful week. Next Saturday, then. Next Saturday, then. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.